Thank you, Madeline. And thank you all for being here today. Um, I'll just give a brief little introduction and then we'll jump, jump into the presentation. So my name is Megan Wyndham. I'm a registered and licensed dietitian. Um, if you've heard me speak before, prior to my role where I currently am now, I was with University Health Services for about 12 years um, in the Butyl Health Center seeing students as patients. So I did a lot of clinical work there. Um, I have now transferred over the railroad tracks onto West Campus in the Department of Nutrition, and now I'm a clinical um, assistant professor and associate director for the Dietetic Internship Program. So still have a hand that directly related to students, um, but I'm excited to share some of this with knowledge with you today. Um, please feel free to type in the chat as we go throughout. Unmute yourself if you'd rather do that as well. I want to make sure that I answer those questions for you. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about nutrition and sleep and sleep on nutrition. And we'll kind of see both sides of those aspects. But like I said, stop me at any point if you have questions or concerns and uh, we'll learn together. All right. Um, so why do we need sleep? Many of you probably know, you know, there's many reasons that sleep is good. It kind of allows us to recharge and give that body um, the energy that it needs for the next day, the brain needs to function properly with um, getting that proper sleep. And we do know that there's a lot of correlations behind some of our chronic diseases and sleep deprivation. And I'll walk you through some of those here today at the end of the presentation with specifically diabetes, obesity, some of our heart disease risk, um, and our poor mental health. So we'll talk through those and how that can impact um, just overall health and sleep is a big factor in that. All right. Um, so we know though, too, as we age, the amount of sleep that we need declines. So Madeline had her little one here today and um, those sleep patterns are much greater and longer than we do need as adults. Um, but we also know that about 10 to 30% of adults live with some sort of insomnia. Um, insomnia can be defined as really just lying in bed for more than 15 to 20 minutes with when having trouble sleeping, difficulty sleep, staying asleep throughout the night, um, really leading to that inconsistent sleep schedule. And here again, this can impact our overall health and nutrition. Um, so let's take a deeper dive into that here. So we're first going to talk about how nutrition affects sleep. And so what are some habits that we're doing or not doing or maybe haven't considered and how we can get better sleep quality? Um, so I'll touch on each one of these. And um, we'll talk about caffeine, alcohol, spicy foods, some of our high carbohydrate rich foods, and then just overall nutrition. Um, and like I said, stop me at any point if you have questions or you've heard differently, maybe um, there's a lot of um, miscommunication and sometimes misinformation when we read online or in our sources that we're getting our nutrition information. So let's first start with caffeine. And many of you know, this is a stimulant. Okay. So it's, it's supposed to keep us up longer or make us more alert during the day. So certainly when we have this later on in the evening, or maybe at certain periods of time in the day, it can disrupt our sleep patterns. Um, studies usually show when we're consuming it about, you know, later, less than six hours before bedtime, we might notice an even more effect. Um, and the reason for that is as caffeine competes with adenosine, and that can impact just that stimulation and that ability to fall asleep. So some suggestions here would be maybe our green tea or herbal teas later in the day to give us a slight boost in energy without having that higher level of caffeine. Now, um, I give this slide here too, just to show that um, there are levels of caffeine um, that we might see higher in certain drinks than others. And certainly like our supplements or, you know, our um, caffeine little beans or energy drinks or energy shots or even espresso is going to be sometimes higher than if we look at just our plain coffee or instant coffee or even our black teas and sodas. So, um, I show this just to give a better understanding and maybe there are things we could do for an energy boost later in the day or afternoon, as opposed to um, sticking to a little bit more of that higher level of caffeine in our coffee. Um, and we, we consider about four cups of coffee per day safe. So that's about 400 milligrams per day. Um, you can just see how maybe two ounces of an energy drink or energy shot of um, those higher levels can have upwards of 200 milligrams a day. So we can we can overdo it pretty quickly, which is why we might see some impact in our overall sleep quality or sleep behaviors. 
So let's look at alcohol next. So uh, many people would think, okay, I have a glass of wine before bed or I have a drink and it helps me sleep or go to sleep. Um, and so certainly it can, so it can, it's a sedative. It kind of helps us relax, helps us maybe fall asleep, but really what it impacts is those deeper levels of sleep and those cycles where we, we um, find middle of the night or later on in our sleep patterns that it just kind of wears off and we're waking up or we just don't have good quality of that sleep. Um, it also has been linked to alcohol in particular can um, worsen snoring or sleep apnea, um, dry mouth. So we tend to see that becoming impacting <clears throat> our overall quality of sleep. So while we might not feel like, hey, I had a poor night's rest, we might see that just the overall quality and maybe even those who we're sleeping with notice some of that breathing um, challenges or sleep apnea or snoring more, which disrupt other sleep patterns as well. Um, so a recommendation here would be more of like our tart cherry juice. I'll talk about melatonin here shortly, um, but tart cherry juice, cherry juice in particular has a level of melatonin in it that helps maybe with this um, sedative relaxation technique that alcohol might provide um, in place of alcohol. Spicy foods, this is one we see commonly. Uh, many people are aware of this. Oh, I had a lot of spicy food. I have a lot of heartburn or indigestion. Um, but it is something to be mindful of and be aware of. Sometimes eating too late at night or having some of these richer, spicier foods can impact that quality of sleep. Um, we do know too that that capsaicin, which is a, a component in our red pepper flakes or even in our higher levels of spices, can increase our body temperature, which impacts sleep as well. And uh, many studies would show that a reduced body temperature or cooler environment at night helps with sleeping patterns. And so um, certainly if we're having spicy foods or that increased level of capsaicin, we might notice warmer temperatures, warmer body temperatures, which can impact and disrupt sleep. So the recommendation here with spicy foods or these kind of foods that might cause that disruption um, would be about three hours within bedtime. So trying to have those earlier in the day, maybe at lunchtime or breakfast or, or earlier instead of later at night. Um, high carbohydrates too. Here again, it's kind of that myth. We think, oh, have a we, turkey Thanksgiving dinners coming up and we think the breads and rolls and um, our starchy potatoes and pastas. And we're like, oh, I go to sleep so much better when I have that or it makes me fall asleep. Um, but we know that a lot of our highly refined carbohydrates might impact um, sleep quality, okay? Um, it can decrease the amount of slow wave sleep. Here again, similar to that alcohol content, we might notice just those cycles of sleep are a little bit off or disrupted. Um, so the recommendation is more of our complex carbohydrates, those that have a little bit more fiber in them oatmeal or whole grains even have a little bit of um, protein in them that maybe take longer to digest. And this can release some of that serotonin that we love to feel from carbohydrates, but with the complexity and more fiber in carbohydrates, it can help with a little bit longer. Um, let me, okay, there's a question here too. Sorry, I missed that. Is mushroom coffee a good alternative option instead of regular caffeine? Also, what benefits does it offer? That's a great question. Um, I'm not as familiar with more of our mushroom coffee, so certainly we'd have to look into that on the caffeine levels is sleep quality. Um, more than anything, it's the caffeine from coffee, not necessarily coffee itself. So there's a lot of health benefits from coffee in particular, and, and we're seeing even some of these mushroom coffees and those alternatives that have good benefits. We've seen better diabetes control, weight management control. Um, so those are certainly positive outcomes. I think the real message with this is more linking to later at night or in those stimulant effects. Um, I didn't mention this either, but going back to our caffeine, you know, we kind of have these thresholds. And so if you've never really had much caffeine, you might not take you much to where you feel stimulation. But if you're one who drinks four cups a day regularly, you might need more to feel that effect. And so that's important to consider when we're looking at total milligrams of caffeine. So I can't answer a question on milligrams of caffeine in the mushroom coffee, but I would say that these can have good health benefits. It's just more or less the timing of when we have them in particular to sleep quality. Uh, but thanks for asking that question. That's, that's excellent. So if we think about carbohydrates, here again, they're not bad. It's just what type we have. 
and also um, more of our timing here again. Okay, so let's look at poor nutrition. Poor nutrition overall, um, I think this slide depicts that um, pretty well, is that it's not that we can't ever have these foods. And I think that's a real common misconception is, uh, well, what if I had this once occasionally? Or if I notice I'm having this more regularly, is that a bad thing? Um, just know that when we're inadequate in certain vitamins and minerals and nutrients, we might have poor sleep quality. And I'm going to dive into several of these here, in particular, calcium, magnesium, and certain vitamins. And it just leads to this vicious cycle. So if we don't eat well, we likely sleep worse. And then we, if we don't sleep well, if you're like most Americans, we just don't make good choices when we're tired or hungry or irritable or on the go. And so those are things that's just kind of this overall cycle that we tend to see. So I always start to focus on nutrition first, because if we work on small behavior change and improving our diet, likely we'll see better sleep changes. And then when we have better sleep patterns and we're sleeping better through the night or longer or better quality, then likely we're going to make better choices that next day or week or that month. So um, just keeping that in mind that while well, we might have changed our environment and changed our pillows and changed all the things that we can control, our nutrition is a big part of that that we can focus on and work towards changing. Um, so nutrition is one of those things that we'll, we'll look at certain vitamins and minerals here. Okay, so how do we catch more Z's? How do we get better at this? Um, we hear melatonin a lot in media. I hear it a lot from the students that I work with. Also, what is it? Do we need it? Should we be supplementing it? Even as a parent, I have a lot of um, younger moms asking, should I be giving supplements to my kids? They're not sleeping very well. And what we do know is that melatonin is naturally produced in the body, okay? And so it's something that we, we um, our body naturally has, and our levels usually rise about two hours before bedtime to help with promotion of sleep, okay? Um, when we look at supplementation, melatonin is, is an herb, okay, or supplement. So it's something that if you want to take it or want to consider taking it, I would certainly talk with your physician or medical provider or registered dietitian. Just note that a lot of times our supplementation forms with anything, not just melatonin, but with anything, we don't absorb it as well as we would from actually getting it from food, okay? So our list of foods here are tart cherries, milk, eggs, fish, several nuts, pistachios in particular, are good sources of melatonin. And so if we can include some more of those in our diet, even maybe that later in the evening before bed, it's a great way to help with maybe calming down and getting um, that release that we would want more appropriately. It's not that supplement is a bad form, but here again, we just don't absorb it as well. And we they're not regulated like food. And so food first is where we're gonna get best, our best benefit here. We also know that we have other foods and food groups um, that help with that getting better sleep, but we're also, most Americans are usually getting lower intakes of or deficient in. And I'm gonna walk through each of these here for you. So let's start with vitamin A. Um, vitamin, a vitamin A, as we know, is you know usually the one, eat carrots and improve your vision or help with eyesight. So certainly it does that, um, but it helps with immune function, reproduction, cellular communication. And it's also very much involved in our circadian rhythms, okay? And it's circadian rhythms are really this adjustment from light to dark cycles. And um, you may felt a little off about, what, three weeks ago or so when the time changes. I know I do, because those light and dark cycles are off by an hour. Or we might notice we're waking up earlier because it's lighter or wanting to go to bed earlier when it's dark at 5.30 p.m., um, and so vitamin A, when we're deficient in that, it kind of disrupts these normal patterns in how we um, feel more tired or awake at certain periods of time. We do also have two forms of vitamin A in our diet. We have preformed and proformed, and one's from animal and one's from plant. Um, but I give you a list here of different sources of vitamin A rich foods. Um, know that vitamin A, there's an upper level that we can consume that's more toxic. So if we're doing a lot of supplementation with vitamin A, I would discourage from that and be mindful of how much we're actually getting from our diet and our supplement. Um, so here again, getting it from our fruits, vegetables, and even these food sources listed here 
is a great way to help with maybe regulation of some of those sleep cycles. Vitamin C is another one. So um, we kind of think about this is a season usually where we notice a little bit more illnesses, colds, flus, viruses. Um, and we see vitamin C being uh, marketed a little bit heavier. And so certainly it's helpful for using um, to make more collagen, to strengthen our immune system. Um, if we're deficient in iron, vitamin C um, taken with iron. So like say we're taking an iron supplement, if you drink that with a glass of orange juice or drink that with something rich in vitamin C, it helps our body absorb the iron. Um, so anyone who's deficient in iron might notice a benefit there. Um, we do know that vitamin C breaks down over time. So we want to make sure we're eating those pretty quickly after purchase instead of letting those sit in the fridge or counter for a longer time. Um, here again, we want to try to minimize, not minimize, but be mindful of how much vitamin C that we're consuming. There is such thing as too much, um, but when we get it mainly from our foods, it's most beneficial. Um, our mind often goes to citrus for vitamin C, um, right? But there is one that's a little bit higher in vitamin C, and those are red bell peppers are actually higher in vitamin C than an orange. So um, these are great ways that we can get more of these foods in and try and encourage that to strengthen our immune system, um, but help with tiredness and fatigue as well. Um, vitamin D is, a, is one that we hear maybe a lot more in the media, that along with magnesium, which I'll talk about here. We know vitamin D helps with bone health, um, but there's a lot of research around just vitamin D and cancers, depression, brain function, autoimmune conditions. Um, so there, there is a lot of positivity behind that. And so if we think about just depressed mood or um, more of these um, psychological effects that we have or anxiety that we're facing, vitamin D can be helpful for that. And so you can see a list here of foods rich in vitamin D. Um, there's a research study, which I've linked here, um, VDS, vitamin D supplementation, is promising and improving some of our sleep quality. A lot of that still needs to be investigated, but um, we're thinking it could be likely tied to looking at just mental health and feeling more um, positive and less depressed um, effects. So vitamin D is one that if we're not um, conscious about how much we're getting, I would strongly encourage to just start monitoring that to see how much we're getting or include some of these foods in our diet to help. I listed here too, we get vitamin D from the sun. So um, that is one way that we can help our body enhance vitamin D absorption. However, when we think about this time of year, it's more challenging. Um, it's darker earlier. We may not be outside as much due to cooler temperatures. So um, that's one thing foods are important, especially now. Vitamin E is important for vision, reproduction, blood, brain, and skin health. It's also an antioxidant, which helps with just fighting free radicals, helping with um, disease prevention. But here again, too much is not a good thing. Um, I have listed some foods that are higher in vitamin E as well, just to note that these are great things that we could be consuming more of in our diet. Okay, vitamin K is another one here as well. Um, certainly it's essential for blood clotting. It comes from food, but also it's um, generated from healthy bacteria in our colon. Um, we need to be mindful of if you're taking any blood thinners or blood thinner medications of how much vitamin um, K we're consuming and keeping that consistent. And then I've listed some here as well. So if we think of even just like blood flow and function, that can help with a lot of just feeling um, more energized and having blood flowing properly, which we'll talk about here with magnesium. Um, calcium kind of goes hand in hand with vitamin D. Certainly we know strong bones, teeth, um, all of those things as well. But um, one thing I want to point out here is it helps the body use tryptophan to manufacture melatonin. So um, this is a mechanism in our body that helps with in increasing or uh, manufacturing melatonin at those points of times right before bed. Um, so it's, it's a key nutrient that we should be consuming. With patients that I've worked with before, we hear a lot about lactose intolerant or I don't like dairy or can't consume um, dairy for a certain reason. Um, when we think about lactose intolerance in particular related to dairy, many people aren't aware that our hard cheeses, so like Parmesan cheese, cheddar cheese, Swiss cheeses, harder cheeses naturally have very little lactose in them. So they're usually tolerated much better. 
Our Greek yogurt in particular, um, which we see a lot of on the shelves nowadays, is naturally lower in lactose as well. So those are good sources of calcium that are still in the dairy family that we could be incorporating in our diet without having that um, GI concern of the discomfort maybe. But there's also other calcium rich foods, um, such as like our fortified orange juices or cereals. Um, those are all great ways that we can get in a little bit more calcium. Almonds um, are one of the only nuts that have calcium in them. So that's another great way that we can be incorporating that. So just thinking of ways that maybe if you're not already doing these things that we could um, impact that in a way that um, gives us some variety in our diet, but helps with overall health and sleep patterns. And magnesium. Magnesium is a big one right now, too. So kind of vitamin D was a hot nutrient for a while, and now magnesium is kind of giving it a run for its money. Um, but with magnesium, this really helps with healthy bones and healthy heart. It helps with um, dilation of blood vessels, so it helps with blood flow. So we think of people who maybe have chronic headaches or migraines or um, cramping. So we notice when we have adequate levels of magnesium, that tends to improve a little bit. So here again, reduction in stress, inflammation, relaxation of muscles, and then lists of foods that are rich in magnesium. So good sources here that we could be including in our overall eating pattern. So just some more additional tips before we dive into the second half here. Um, as you, you might already know, or I've heard maybe in this sleep series, consistent bedtime, even on the weekends. And for any of you who have kids or, or family members who have kids, you know that that's important for them, just as it is for adults. And when we have that inconsistency, that circadian rhythm gets off a little bit and we tend to have disruptive sleep patterns. Certainly a comfortable sleep environment. So we're thinking mattress, pillow, um, temperature, sound machine, having maybe some of that background noise. Um, I mentioned here abstaining from coffee or alcohol, large meals leading up to bedtime. Um, some people would argue that when I exercise later at night, I sleep better. Some would say the opposite. So I see mixed reviews on this. But for the most part, people would say if we exercise during the day or in the morning, we tend to have better sleep quality as opposed to exercising and then going right to bed. Um, Getting some light, sometimes that can be hard to do. As I mentioned, this time of year, that can be a little bit more challenging, but trying to sync our bodies with those natural rhythms and really trying not to eat too late. Um, if we can eat within one to two hours of going to bed, that can really help. Um, think about that. Your, your blood flow um, is all going to your stomach to digest and break down that food. And so it's not going to the brain or muscles or for that relaxation. It's working really hard to process that. And so if we're working really hard to do that, it's not able to relax in other ways. Um, so not only is it what we're eating, but some of that process and how it's breaking down that can impact just overall sleep. Okay. Um, overall, when we think about a balanced diet or, or what is the best diet approach, you know, as a registered dietitian, I would never um, say that a diet is probably the best thing to follow unless it has that balance to it. And we see a lot of trends and fads in um, what people are choosing. When I, when I think of what a plan would be to follow, if someone's really wanting to look a little deeper in this, the Mediterranean diet really has been effective in just improving overall chronic diseases, health patterns, sleep patterns, and you can see what that includes here. So it, it includes a lot of different things, things that we should all be um, including in our diet, such as fruits, vegetables, our whole grains, starchy components, beans, nuts, and seeds. Um, when we look at our fat source, usually it's olive oil or more of those liquid-based oils. Um, we're incorporating dairy, we're incorporating eggs, fish, and poultry. And we're really limiting those things that many of us get a lot of in our diet. Um, added sugars, higher sodium foods, refined products. Um, more of our refined carbohydrates, meaning those things that have less fiber in them. Um, those are things that we, we see on every street corner. We see when we go out to eat or when we're getting quick foods. But if we can focus on maybe some healthier habits at home, it can really be beneficial. Um, question here, um, suggested under your suggested foods on some earlier slides, you have cereal. Is this cereal as grains, nuts, and oats, or as box breakfast type cereal? That's a great question. Um, 
So in that, that reference in cereal, it was looking at some of our vitamins and minerals that um, support getting, getting more of in our diet without looking at maybe dairy in particular or looking at a meat product. Um, so when we think about cereals or grains in particular, okay, so even on this slide here talking about um, our Mediterranean diet, when we think about grains, I would always encourage more whole grains, okay? So that could be oatmeal, that could be brown rice, that could be whole grain wheat, um, that could be quinoa, those are all whole grains. And what that means is it has more fiber in it and likely sometimes a little bit of protein. And we know that fiber and protein help us feel fuller longer, okay? There's also a great benefit in fiber, right? For digestive health and improving gut function. So those are all excellent benefits there. Where we get a lot of questions are these boxed cereals or maybe processed foods or prepackaged foods. Um, and I would always argue that process doesn't mean unhealthy at all. Um, there's a lot of great benefit in particular to our cereals. If we look at a nutrition facts panel on cereal grains, so I'm talking a box Cheerios, um, if we look at those, there's a lot of fortification, meaning vitamins and minerals that are added to that product to help with uh, meeting the needs of Americans that maybe not aren't getting it in other ways. So there's calcium added or vitamins added or iron added. And those are all excellent ways that we can help with absorption of nutrients. Okay. Um, so while when we look at a box cereal, I would certainly say trying to minimize added sugar. And my recommendation is usually 10 grams or less of added sugar per serving. Box cereals aren't horrible. They're not bad. They're a great part of a diet, um, especially for families with kids. Those are a way that sometimes that's how we get our iron if they're not eating meat, or that's a way we get our calcium if they're maybe not consuming dairy products. So when I refer to grains, I would say you could refer to both. Um, certainly um, your brown rice and quinoa and oats and those things are all great full grains, but our cereal products can do that as well. We just have to be mindful of the added sugar, but knowing even if it does have some added sugar, my recommendation usually is the, if the favorite cereal in the house is Frosted Flakes and it's got more than 10 grams of sugar per serving that's added sugar, can we pair that with just a cornflake that's not sugar and just mix the two together? So it helps with lowering added sugar, but it also gives us the benefit of those fortified nutrients in that um, cereal as well. So that's an excellent question. Um, and I don't want you to be afraid of box cereals or packaged products. It's really just knowing what we're getting in there and being a smart consumer when it comes to purchasing that. So thank you for that question, Diana. So this is kind of the balanced approach if we're looking at a Mediterranean diet, okay? Now let's, that was kind of a more, how does nutrition affect sleep? And we know that when we eat poorly or we don't have a balanced diet or we eat um, different types of foods on that list provided, we might sleep worse, okay? But we also know that even despite our best nutrition efforts and eating well, sometimes poor sleep can impact how, what we choose. So let's talk a little bit about how does our sleep affect nutrition and our health, okay? Um, we know that nutrition is very much linked to many chronic diseases, um, obesity, metabolic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular, immune, mental health, and these are things that I briefly mentioned earlier. But I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what the why in this, and then think about, um, as we reflect back, how can we improve our nutrition that might help with these conditions, but also what are things we can do with our sleep quality and sleep patterns and timing that might affect our nutrition, okay? So if we think about obesity and metabolic disorders. So metabolic disorders are really those outcomes of um, those comorbidities or the effects of having a larger body weight. Um, so when we think about this population, we're usually more likely to make poor food choices, okay? So whether that's time or convenience or taste palate or how we were raised, there's so many things that impact um, someone's risk factor for obesity, and it can be even genetic with that. Um, this leads to eating maybe larger quantities of food. Think about eating out or restaurants or fast food. The serving sizes given are much larger than we should be consuming. But if that's our norm or if that's what we're used to, that's what we might be wanting or craving or feeling full from, okay? So when we have that too, and when we have um, 
obesity, usually we have these imbalance of hormones, ghrelin and leptin, and those are the signals for satiety or fullness and hunger. And so hormones can be off when we have more of those obesity factors. And then we have a lot of increased cravings for our calorie dense foods. Um, that could be because we're not sleeping well, that now we need to stay up later and we're going to the vending machine or going for those higher calorie foods. Um, it could be the imbalance of hormones that I'm just not feeling full. Um, this can even be linked to those um, night shift workers or maybe truck drivers. We see a higher risk of obesity because of maybe the food choices that we're consuming, but also those imbalances of hormones there as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, this is a good question here again. We'll, um, I'll answer this and then we'll keep going here. So I mentioned fortified items like fortified orange juice, fortified with calcium, for example. So, you know, the orange juice says it, it includes calcium or fortified with calcium or vitamin D can be helpful. How is fortified different or better than taking supplements? So that's an excellent question here too. Um, remember, or re, if you remember, I kind of talked about when we have nutrients paired with some of these vitamins and supplements, it helps absorb them better, okay? So when we take a capsule of like melatonin or vitamin D on its own, one, that supplement form isn't regulated like our food is, okay? So there's a lot more regulation on the food label and what's added to that cereal box or added to that orange juice than a supplement, okay? So two different regulatory bodies, one Food and Drug Administration um, looking at that and then the other is just kind of third parties that are looking at it, um, more supplements. So there's a lot tighter regulation when it's in a food or on a label, okay? Um, Absorption wise, so we likely will absorb a little bit more of that vitamin C or vitamin D because it's paired with something. So it's paired with the orange juice or it's paired with the cereal grain or it's paired with that carbohydrate included in the grain. So absorption is a little bit greater. It's not that a supplement or herb doesn't give us some um, benefit or absorption. It's just those two things. One, it's not regulated like food. So it depends where we get it, who's making it, how it's manufactured to really understand is really what's in it, what they say is in it. And two, um, we have to understand that if we're just taking it on its own, it might not have the full effect as if we had it with food. Um, so that, that's an excellent question there as well. So thank you for that. Um, question was here chicory. Is that like more chicory root for carbohydrate or is that for, are we talking about for caffeine? I don't think chicory has any caffeine actually. I think it's just an alternative um, because it doesn't have, it's not bitter. I think it's just like a root of a plant. Yes, it is. Yeah. Sorry. I just didn't know if that was in related to the caffeine question. So um, yeah. So chicory root is more just like a added we see it in, in use in for a lot of added fiber, okay? So it's kind of a bulking agent. Um, we see it in more of like fiber one products or things that have a lot of fiber in them that maybe naturally didn't. So it's more of that insoluble fiber. So it doesn't really, um, it, it doesn't, it, it absorbs, yes, but it's more kind of just a bulking agent for the, for lack of a better term. And so it kind of helps with giving us some fiber, but it may not have the benefits that we see from some of our um, soluble fibers, like the, the grain of oat or bran that has more of a soluble nature to it, which helps a little bit in different ways, especially with um, cholesterol lowering effect. So yes, um, good question, Lauren. Thank you for that. All good questions. So feel free to keep typing and I will keep answering as we go through. So this kind of talks about obesity. Insulin sensitivity and diabetes. So we know that um, with disruptions in sleep, our cells become less receptive to insulin. So if we're someone who needs and is dependent on insulin, or from all of us, our, nat our body naturally produces insulin too in response to the carbohydrates, unless we have type 1 diabetes, um, our cells become less receptive to that with poor sleep. Um, so we also are, should be aware that our low blood sugar levels while sleeping can lead to stimulation and release of adrenaline, cortisol, which promotes awakening. So here again, disruptions in sleep based on disruptions in our glucose control. Um, so we do know that that can impact our sleep. 
Cardiovascular disease is another one. So cortisol here again comes up. So those levels can increase at night when sleep quality is poor. And think of this kind of fight or flight stage. So if we have this, I'm awake a lot during the night or I'm thinking about things a lot at night or something's on my mind, we have this increase in cortisol up and down, um, which can impact our overall sleep quality. Um, there's also literature to support that one to two hours of sleep reduction at night can increase our systolic blood pressure. So we might notice changes in blood pressure rates with changes in sleep quality. So here again, sleep really does impact these conditions, even if we're not predisposed to them, even if maybe we have healthy eating patterns, um, poor sleep can lead us to have more risk for obesity and cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Immune health is another one. We talked a lot about our vitamin C and how that helps with immunity and immune function. Um, and this is kind of a, a no brainer for many people, but if we're getting less than six hours of sleep at night, we're four times as likely to become ill after exposure to a flu virus. And here again, our body needs that recovery. It needs that time to um, just rest at night instead of working all the time. And so we notice that poor immune quality is increased with poor sleep. And then mental health, and this is one that I think has always been there, is just coming out a little bit more in our research and also even in some of the papers that we see online. Um, there's strong correlation between sleep disturbances and many of our psychiatric disorders. So we do know that that's there. Um, there's also an interesting point that if we're sleep deprived or tired or don't um, have great quality of sleep, we're probably less likely to engage in social interaction or events. And some people might think, well, how does that impact this? We know that social interaction and being around others and, and engaging in those situations helps with mood and improving overall health. Um, so sleep can impact that. Um, another point here, too, is the amygdala, which is the brain's epicenter more emotionally, is 60% more reactive with lack of sleep. And many of you have probably found that, or if you've had a newborn or you've had a stressful situation in your life and you're not sleeping very well, we notice more emotion, and that could be positive or negative, with lack of sleep. And so it really, truly does impact our overall mental health. Okay. So with that, we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, I want to open it up for any questions that you might have, um, even if they're just general nutrition questions. I don't mind that at all either, but anything related to sleep or anything that I've mentioned in the slides that you want to revisit or go over, I am certainly happy to, to answer those for you. And feel free to unmute yourself, or you can certainly um, type in the chat. I have a question. Sure. Um, my husband um, recently had uh, kidney cancer and uh, had a kidney removed. And he's recently started suffering from um, insomnia. Um, and I don't know if that's due to nutrition or... Um, or medication differences or what. Um, it, we don't eat late at night uh, anymore. We have made um, dietary changes. Um, we met with a dietitian uh, shortly after the surgery. Um, so I'm not sure. He started having like night terrors um, initially, and now he's just really suffering from insomnia. What would you suggest um, that we do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think you, you've done a lot of really good steps too. I was certainly, you know, looking at the whole diet approach and evaluating that. What are we consuming, not consuming? Are we missing anything? You know, you mentioned not eating late at night. So I think you can kind of check that off there as well. You know, I would check just the sleeping environment, but it sounds like to me there could be maybe, and I'm not a physician, but some sort of medication interaction that might be, you know, a side effect of the medication could be insomnia or the night terrors or having more of those um, disordered thoughts around that. So I would maybe evaluate that piece of it and, and look further into that. And there might not be a medication alternative based on his condition. 
Um, so keeping that in mind, um, you know, for some people too, a lot of it is just getting into that routine. And so if it's, you know, turning lights off or electronics off or having more um, routine around that can be helpful. Um, for some people too, it's been helpful to do like just a little meditation before bed to kind of calming the mind. Um, that's where I find a lot of sleep, sleep disturbances happen in, in adults in particular is that we, our mind is racing with different things. And then the anxiety continues to increase in that cortisol, as we talked about, it kind of releases again. And so then once it's up, it's kind of this fight or flight. We're constantly in this state of like up and down from, I say anxiety, but it's more or less just kind of this fear or um, terror or tremors that's going on. Um, so for that, it might just be more of that, you know, 30 minutes of listening to a meditative um, podcast or having something there that might be beneficial. Um, you know, if you haven't tried like the tart cherry juice, that could be a, a positivity or a change that we might make with that as well um, to see if that can maybe just help with some calming effect um, before bed too. Um, but that that's tricky too, because it sounds like you've done a lot of really positive things it's just a matter of maybe figuring out if that's a side effect or if it's something that can be, if, and if it is a side effect, if nothing can be changed medication wise, can we manage that possibly through other ways? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay. So what benefits does vitamin B provide difference between B6, B12, B complex? Yes. Yeah, so um, when we look at our B vitamins, um, B12 in particular, many, if you're we're vegetarian or vegan, um, many people might not be getting enough of that because it, it comes direct, it, it's mainly from our animal sources, okay? It's not that we can't get it from other ways, but most animal sources will provide that B12, okay? Um, and then we also have other B vitamins that all bring different things to the table. It's kind of like our... Um, you know, vitamin A, C, D, E, they all bring different things and we need them um, to help function. You know, a lot of our B vitamins too, like thiamine or folate, we look at those when we think about just um, pregnancy or, or pre-pregnancy and health in, in the population as well. So um, our B vitamins too, we see some fortification here in our grains. Um, so our grains might have that cereals in particular nutritional yeast and not the yeast that uses to rise bread, but nutritional yeast and for and, um, on its own has a, is a great source of B12 for those who might be deficient or low in or not having enough or have a harder time getting B12 in the diet. So they all provide different things and bring different things to the table. B complex is usually a, a um, when we look at like a vitamin, so it says B complex, it might have all of those in there. If we just look at B12 supplement, it might just be B12. So that's why it's important to look at that label because there are different types of B vitamins and they're all linked to a certain nutrient. But great question there, Maria. Thank you for that. What is nutritional yeast? Gosh, I wish I had some in here with me to show you. Um, it's really like these little, almost uh, kind of yellowish golden flakes, okay? Um, you probably can find it more in like the health food section of the store. So you're probably not gonna find it in the baking section, but more in um, the, the healthy living section of the store. And many of my patients that I worked with might sprinkle it on like um, pasta or maybe in an oatmeal or you can even make a cheese sauce with it using cashews and nutritional yeast that kind of has this cheesy type feel to it, but it's a vegan. Um, and so it it's an excellent way to add more B12 in our diet if we struggle with getting animal products in. Um, okay, here's another question. Do we get a benefit from nut milks for the calcium levels or does the dairy calcium work better? This is a great question to you, Diana. So let's talk a little bit about milk alternatives. So when we say milk alternatives or nut milk, so that's almond milk, cashew milk, rice milk, um, not necessarily a nut, but a milk alternative. Um, we see oat milk now um, here again. So that is something um, that we can think about. Um, so those milks 
are, um, if we if we just think about the concept of this, oats don't make milk and almonds don't make milk. So there's a lot more that goes into that than just a natural form. So if we look at the ingredient list on our milk alternatives, usually it's fairly long. Um, there might be things in there that you're not aware of. So I would just I'd encourage you to read the label, okay? Because a lot of times it's mainly water and then a few other things. Yes, they're a lot lower in calorie than cow's milk, but the reason for that is the protein content difference is significant. So while cow's milk, whether it's low fat or full fat or reduced fat, might have eight grams of protein per cup, your rice milk, almond milk, cashew milk might have one or less. Okay, so the calorie difference comes from the protein, usually not nutrients. Um, when we think about calcium, so yes, there's calcium. So remember, almonds have calcium in there. Um, we can fortify that in some of our products. So yes, there's calcium. There's usually vitamin D, which is added to whether that's cow's milk or our um, natural dairy cow's milk uh, or milk alternatives. They both have that. Um, the benefit, though, is when we look at the difference in these, that Cow's milk is usually about four ingredients. Okay, so it's like milk, vitamin D, vitamin A, and one other fortification piece. When we look at our others, there's a lot more that goes into that. And nutritionally, we're not getting as much protein. Okay, if we just looked at vitamins, though, they can be very similar. Okay, they can be very similar calcium levels, very similar vitamin D levels. It's just knowing what we're getting and why we're buying it. If uh, there's certain reasons that we're not buying buying cow's milk because, say, we have lactose intolerance, well, are there other alternatives that still provide that protein? We might look at something like Mutopia, is HEB's brand of cow's milk that's lactose free. We might look at maybe a soy milk because soy milk protein is about the same as cow's milk compared to very little in almond milk or rice milk. Okay, so. Um, that fortification is still present in those two, but I would say your better bang for your buck nutritionally would be your cow's milk because of that protein level and the less added ingredients that it offers. <clears throat> but that's a, a great question there. Um, hopefully that helped, Diane. If you have more questions, I'm happy to answer those too. Um, let's see. There's some comments here on the nutritional yeast. They get theirs from HEB. Um, B-R-A-G-G -G brand. Um, yeah, and so some people are talking about liquid aminos versus soy sauce. Yes, Andrea, um, liquid aminos is a good alternative to soy sauce. It has very similar flavor, and a lot of patients um, enjoy that without the um, added sodium there. So that looks good there as well. But yes, nutritional yeast, I, I have never bought it personally, but I know um, it is sold at HEB and can be utilized for B12 levels. So thank y'all for, for sharing that um, and commenting there, Andrea, I appreciate that. Great questions, other questions that I can help answer. I am going to type my email here in the chat. Um, if you have questions or want to reach out in any way, I'm happy to do that. And you can contact me um, at any point. I can share these slides with you too, Madeline, if you want to share with the participants today. Happy to do that as well. Um, really, like I said, I um, enjoy helping people. I enjoy helping students um, and I enjoy being here at Texas a &M. So if I can do anything for any of you, um, know that I'm available and happy to do so.